Well, good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Josh Schimmels, publisher and CEO of the Los Angeles Business Journal. It's a pleasure to host today's real estate trends discussion. Um, you know, I'll tell you, based on, we get so many inquiries and we get a lot of feedback from our subscribers and our readers. And based on that, it's really clear that real estate, office environments, what's happening with industrial space, we've seen so much activity there, uh, and really issues impacting all three continue to be at the forefront of our readers' minds. So today, we have an opportunity to hear from, learn from, and engage with some of our region's most knowledgeable experts in these areas. Uh, let me tell you how the next 75 minutes or so is gonna break down. We're gonna have two 35-minute panels, and we're gonna begin with industrial trends. So here, we'll be taking a look at what's been happening, what's happening today, this, fires, this space, as we know, has been on fire for quite a uh, while now. How is that going to change? Is uh, the, the rise, the continued rise in interest rates going to be impacting the market? What are overall trends that we can expect to see in the next few months and really for the rest of the year and into first quarter of next year? Our second panel, we're going to focus on office and the new workplace. What does it look like today? And what will the new workplace look like? You know, we talk about this a lot, but it continues to evolve. This is something that employers are continuing to try to figure out, in particular, as we see uh, in, in situations like today, where we see yet again another rise in COVID cases, many employees working from home again. So the question is, have employers figured out what works or are spaces still continuing to evolve? We're gonna take a look at what we can expect in lease or purchase structures, and again, the overall market within the next several months and into next year. I wanna thank those of you who have submitted questions during the registration. We always take those questions and try to incorporate as many of them as possible into our pre-scripted Q&A so that um, in, in short, you've all helped us already shape the conversation. So thank you for that. During the interactive discussions, you're going to be uh, seeing pop-up poll questions. These are live audience poll questions. Um, we encourage you to spend just a moment, share your responses with us, and then we'll then publish the results of the group online in the next week or so. So you can take a look at that and see how uh, the rest of the market is faring. I wanna thank our sponsors for being a part of this and continuing to ensure that we're able to host these types of events, whether it's uh, digital, we had originally planned on doing this in person, had to make a, a late change to the format, and we appreciate our sponsors for continuing to support it and to continue to keep our readers informed. So thank you all so much. I want to give a special thank you to our two Diamond sponsors, CBRE and Farmers and Merchants Bank. I also want to thank our panel sponsor, Dodo Properties. All right, we've got a lot of great content and I really wanna get into it. So I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Our first panel this afternoon is Alan Kraft. He's the Chief Operating Officer at D D Dodo Properties. Next, we have Tunde Ogunwale, VP Development Officer at Prologis. Luke Stobitz, Executive Vice President of Kidder Matthews. And today's moderator, Phil Bond, Executive Vice President and Chief Credit Officer at Farmers and Merchants Bank. Phil, it's great to have you back. Thanks again for joining us for yet another great conversation. Josh, thanks. My pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity here to moderate a panel that consists of seasoned, successful industry participants like we have here today. I'm excited to have a front row seat to hear about their outlook on occupancy levels and trends, development activity, the economic environment, interest rates, and supply chain impact. So. On that note, uh, let's kick off the conversation with a question to Alon and Luke. Uh, how would you describe the leasing volatility over the last 90 days? Alon, let's kick things off with you. Thanks, Phil, and, and thanks everybody here. Uh, uh, happy to participate. Um, you know, notwithstanding, you know, having entered into the summer and you know, a lot of folks catching up on vacations and everything else. We've, over the last 90, 120 days, we've been really fortunate, at least in the space uh, that we operate in, to continue to see very robust activity. 
Um, as, as a lot of you may know, we, we're focused on the uh, high throughput e-commerce space, so terminals, trailer yards, in addition to some of the commodity warehouse and cold storage. And uh, we've continued to see robust demand by tenants uh, looking for space, you know, as we continue to see things like moratoriums, environmental lawsuits, um, other things like that that are starting to limit supply opportunities. We are seeing a lot of tenants uh, entering in the markets, trying to grab up space as it becomes available. So to date, um, and appreciate this is pretty much a lagging indicator, um, to date, we continue to see this really strong activity. We've had limited downtime on most of our properties um, and you know, certainly looking for some of that continued success to continue on for the balance of the summer and into the fall. Luke, what are your thoughts on that front? You know, for the most part, we believe demand peaked at the end of the first quarter after a 20 month run for the ages. Our team currently lists class A, class B buildings and surface lots from 10,000 feet to 400,000 feet from Culver City down through the south base of the port. So we have a good bead on activity levels for different space sizes and demand is holding up, but inquiries, tours, offers, are more in line with pre-pandemic levels, which were still very healthy, I might add. I'd also like to say that there are decreasing multiple offer situations and the transaction lifespan is lengthening. So we're seeing leasing velocity return to a more normal pace and that the hyperactivity during the pandemic is now largely in the past as markets seek to find new equilibrium. equilibrium. Uh, the party isn't over, but it's just a different party. Luke, overall, what are what are users looking for in industrial in LA? And are you able to give us any specific examples? Thanks, Phil. So users are looking for quality class A and B logistics buildings, surface lots for trailer and container storage, and what I've characterized as space tech manufacturing buildings with heavy power in that general order. Home Depot leased 180,000 feet in Carson in May class A building at 205 per square foot triple net, which remains the high water mark in buildings over 100,000 feet, despite many rumors that deals are pending at 10% higher than that. We just signed a lease last week for a 50,000 foot class A logistics building in El Segundo at 295 triple net with an international logistics company, but I consider that rate an outlier due to the location and the unique qualities of that facility. Relativity and a host of other rocket companies of ink deals totaling millions of square feet in that space tech sector. We just completed 10 year leases with ex SpaceX engineers starting up companies named Varda Space Systems, 60,000 feet in El Segundo, and a company called Impulse Space for 60,000 feet in Redondo Beach. All of these space transactions are securitized by letters of credit, typically equaling at least a year's base rent and operating expenses. Varda was at an asking rate deal of $1.85 on a triple net basis. Impulse was above asking rate at $1.35. All of these transactions are dependent on thousands of amps of power, which can take years and hundreds of thousand dollars to install. An example of a surface lot lease would be Centerpoint's lease of 7.47 acres in North Torrance for $1.15 per land foot on a triple net basis. So while Amazon, FedEx, Flexport, and a whole host of Chinese owned 3PLs are on the sidelines, there's definitely still demand from a wide variety of users. Thanks for that, Luke. Uh, Tunde, you're up on this one. Uh, with the rise in interest rates and potential recession looming, what underlying land price can a developer pay and are land transactions viable in this current, what we'll call price discovery phase of the cycle? You know, the underlying land price is a great question. It's uh, one that many owners and uh, developers are looking at as they're looking at their capital stack and with the interest rates rising, it changes the equation of the underwriting math. The, uh, the short answer would be a little less than what sellers are asking for. Um, in many ways, I think owners are, are seeing uh, the, the tide shift a little bit and get a little bit more normalized. So I'd say that some of the asking prices, there, there is a little bit of retrading that's occurring right now and maybe even 
uh, a projection of a 10% or 15% off of initial asking that's expected over the next 12 months or so, but it really is dependent on what location and uh, what the site characteristics are in terms of what the transaction will be. In spite of some of the headwinds that you hear in the news in terms of recession and uh, some of the challenges uh, with respect to uh, the supply chain, we're still very optimistic on the ability to continue to transact and uh, can grow our portfolio. And so we do expect the next 12 months there will still be ongoing strength in the leasing activity. Um, and we do think that, uh, you know, the, the, there's still things to be optimistic about in terms of being able to transact and lease space over the next several, several months. Great, thanks for your insight on that important topic. Alone, shifting over to you, uh, what are expectations for valuation risk in this increasing interest rate environment? Uh, do folks see risk to market to market valuations hitting institutional investors? And then you know, the possibility of a, of a knock-on effect spreading to the market as a whole. Yeah, and, and even playing off a little bit of, of Tunde's remarks, you know, we are already starting to see, a, I'll call it some cracks as a, a number of investors, especially institutional ones have started to, if they haven't fully put their pencils down, they're, they're taking a call it a soft pause, uh, certainly over the summer, see where things are going. Um, we are absolutely seeing some uh, risk starting to get underwritten into deals. You know, if you think about where we've been over the last few months, you know, we've seen on construction, for example, spreads blow out, you know, by a few hundred basis points and, you know, equity investors are really having to take that uh, into account. And, you know, even if you, you argue maybe there's only been slight increases recently into uh, cap rates, you know, the reality is that spread, especially on say core, core plus deals, that might need some modest renovations, you know, we're already starting to see a lot of deals that equity investors are gonna to have to really take on negative leverage, which we haven't really seen for quite some time for a, a lot of folks. Um, but, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is what that'll probably do is allow all cash buyers or low LTV buyers to be more successful for an interim period of time, but, you know, longer terms and maybe more of an academic perspective, but longer term cap rates are really driven by larger capital flows, including international. And I would see expectations for cap rates to, to be moderated by a lot of things that are happening internationally. So uh, there may be some near term valuation risks that people are going to have to price in. But longer term outside of a deep recession, we think it will price itself out over time. Thanks for sharing that insight with us. Tunde. Circling back to you, I, I think that's the right terminology for a U.S. Naval Academy grad like yourself, uh, circling back. Um, what are some of the key drivers to successfully building in L.A., given its unique political and economic environment? It's a great question. L.A. is a great market because we have uh, two large ports that uh, most folks get their goods through on the western coast. So it's great to be in Los Angeles, but as you alluded to, the political environment is changing. There are cities that have moratoriums and they have uh, restrictions on industrial that have made it into the political outreach, engaging uh, the communities and political outreach to gain support for your project. And candidly, the last few years have been really strong in our market, so it's stressed some of the development teams and uh, the brokers and all the rest of it. So in some ways it's uh, aligning our resources so the projects can be successful. Um, on the development side, working with your architects and general contractors to better understand the costs going into deals given the political environment and the election season uh, can, be, can be really important to make sure that you have solid numbers going in and through the development cycle. And then hope, uh, you know, hoping for the best as you're going through the plan check and permitting process so you can build a successful project. Yeah, I think the concepts there of uh, teamwork, uh, collaboration, and just raw determination are 
incredibly important uh, given kind of where things are at today. Uh, springboarding off some of the comments about supply chain and the like, uh, given the potential for US retrenchment or onshoring, um, how much do folks think this will impact the industrial market going forward, near term and long term? Uh, are there specific markets that stand to benefit more than others? Uh, Alone, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, you know, uh, obviously a lot of news on on onshoring or, or nearshoring, um, and I, th I think as we we do see a lot of globalism start to decline, you're going to see the real impacts of that longer term, and uh, you know we're really going to see a lot of the benefits of that supply chain comes back into the U.S. market to continue to bolster supply. It just pretty much has to at this point from our perspective, and you're going to see a lot of that supply chain come back to the U.S. or Mexico. Um, you know, to Mexico, primarily labor driven uh, from that part. And, you know, what that'll do is it's going to start to continue to drive industrial, more manufacturing. We're seeing that already with Congress taking action on chip supplies. If that's going to happen all here in the U.S., there's going to be new, new buildings need to be built to accommodate a lot of that. So you combine that with retail changes uh, continuing on, even as some retailers are returning to brick and mortar you're really kind of getting this multiplier effect as you start going out to more e-commerce, you bring back the supply chain here, that's gonna to continue to drive demand. It, it's, it's gonna be built into the equation even if there is a, an interim recession. We think places like Southern California are, are going to be very well positioned to take advantage of that, especially as you get manufacturing uh, up from Mexico that is clearly gonna make its way north through California. But you also see other other markets, including places like Texas, but then also some other more, I'll call them inland hubs, whether that's the Inland Empire, but Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, you know, those all stand to benefit as, you know, we kind of realign ourselves uh, into this kind of new paradigm. You know, we still have some wild cards, like with China, as they continue to have, you know, supply chain closures due to COVID. But, but the reality is we're gonna become less dependent over time on China and as we start to really bring in the supply chain closer to the Americas. And, and that's really what we're kind of focused on longer term. Yeah, the recurring theme there alone seems to be long term. If you can hang in there for the long term, uh, that's really a strong position to, uh, to start from. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, industrial right now has the benefit, fingers crossed, and stays that way from being at a robust base. And so even if there's a little bit of a reset, that long term kind of impetus of, of what we're seeing will certainly benefit everyone who's in this space. Luke, uh, can you share with us, please, uh, how do we handicap uh, recessions impact on absorption and in both a soft and, and hard landing scenario. I think folks would really appreciate your thoughts on that. Thanks, Bill. So if the recession's on the milder side, the key to market stability is the 1% vacancy factor and the cost and time to build new product is previously noted. If you take a look at, for instance, Prologis in the Inland Empire, they've got a 63 million square foot portfolio. That's 100% leased and 100% occupied. They're in the process of acquiring Duke, which is another 17 million feet in the IE that is also 100% leased. If you go to the South Bay, Watson Land Company and Carson Companies are essentially full. And these firms have rent rolls filled with strong credit companies with very little roll through at least a year from now. So they have very wisely and luckily planned ahead and are now prepared to withstand any market volatility. So I think in the case of the, the milder side, um, we're not gonna see a dramatic impact. And I would say that this is representative across the landscape of different categories of landlords, both public and private. I see no near-term catalyst for a hard landing on the scale of the Great Recession that will drive vacancy back up dramatically. If it does occur, landlords will revert back to strategies of granting big slugs of free rent and generous tenant improvement concessions concession packages in an effort to preserve rate. Defaults will rise dramatically as some of today's private equity and VC backed space and EV companies fall on hard times, burn through their LCs and implode. I just don't really see anything like this unfolding. And in the unlikely event it does, I'm highly confident that in the development brokerage and investment communities, 
they'll figure out a way to work collaboratively to lessen the pain and create a whole new set of opportunities. On a macro level in the hard event, I think look at events like Blackstone buying PS business parks or Blackstone originating the biggest real estate acquisition vehicle ever or Prologis buying Duke. And that tells you that even if you have a hard landing, there's gonna be a lot of dry power ready to deploy throughout Southern California and especially in infill Los Angeles. That's the perfect setup to uh, circle back to Tunde as the guy with millions of square feet enjoying 100% occupancy with the question, what does the next 12 months look like in the industrial building space? Great question for any of the audience members who've listened to Prologista's Q2 earnings call. We did hit record highs in terms of occupancy, leasing, and uh, rent expectations. So we, we do see that the leasing activity over the next 12 months will be continue to be strong. Uh, we think that those are favorable and uh, those are uh, obviously things to be excited about. Um, given the capital stack that many different developers have in terms of lining up loans, expect owners and developers to be uh, a little bit more conservative in terms of their underwriting and uh, selective in terms of what deals they pursue. So we do think that, that uh, in terms of land acquisition or covered land plays, there'll be less multiple uh, multiple bidders and a, a, a frenzy to acquire and a little bit more of a thoughtful, methodical approach to how people acquire uh, future development opportunities. Great, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, we, we touched a little bit of, uh, in terms of values, um, driving values, of course, cap rates. Um, how much have cap rates moved in the last 90 days to pick a time frame? Luke or anybody else, I'd really welcome your thoughts on that. Um, that's the trillion dollar question, Phil, and no one really has the answer because capital markets are in a state of dislocation that only time and future transaction data points will solve for. Um, so my wild ass guess is that they've moved at least 50 to 70 base, basis points from peak, meaning 3.75 to 4.25 for a quality building that either has a credit lease in place at market rents or has a short-term lease at under market rents that can be repositioned. And that, that's probably being conservative. It could easily be another 25 to 50 basis points on the low side. Um, I, I think equilibrium will be seen when a seasoned guy like Howard Schwimmer at Rexford takes down a building based on a negotiation that started after July 1. It's quiet out there, Luke. I think you've settled that for the others. That's, uh, that is a tough question and I appreciate your candid response there. Um, coming back to you alone, um, while the focus on interest rate increases has been on higher costs to, to, to borrow, um, landlords and possible valuation decline impacts, what are folks doing today to better understand their tenant credit exposure? Yeah. And, you know, I, I will say we, we've spent a lot of time and, and I know a lot of our peers do as well. You know, we spent a lot of time really underwriting our, our tenants. Um, and, you know, we've been we've been in an up cycle where where it's easy to have gotten a little bit lax and believing everything's going to continue to move on an upward trajectory. But, you know, we really have to understand, especially as interest rates continue to uh, increase, you know, we just saw another 75 bips. Uh, there's still some consensus for another 75 to 100 bips before uh, the year comes to an end. If that's going to really materialize, you know, tenants that are heavily leveraged have um, uh, lines of credit, loans that are coming due in the near term. You really want to understand that. And so, you know, Luke even brought it up in part of his discussion. You know, the critical part is at the conception of the lease is the securitization of that lease. It's understanding that credit, trying to find that right balance. You know, we always want 12 months of, of securitization if you could get it, but that's not realistic on all deals. It really is going to be negotiated uh, heavily. But, you know, you really need to work, understand those 
those tenants, who are they? Are they international? Are they local? Where's that money coming from? Um, because we really want to watch what's happening. And then I think you're going to see a lot more landlords requesting uh, interim financials, you know, at least quarterly used to be, you know, maybe annual was okay, but now I think you really want to be closer in, especially for those tenants with the near term uh, maturities. And you may not have a whole lot of levers, but it, at least it allows you to prepare and uh, try to see what you can do to maybe buy somebody out, replace them with a stronger credit. So it, it, it allows you to be proactive if you're able to get the information and stay focused on it. And, and that's what we've been trying to do with a lot of our tenant base. Are there any industries you see out there with heightened exposure on the supply chain front and or heightened exposure to you know, geopolitical risk that you are really drilling down on? Yeah, I mean, I think we spend we spend some time trying to understand, especially, you know, we do have some international tenants and trying to understand where where and what marketplaces they are uh, focused on. Um, it's it's important to to really figure that out, you know, as consumers have retrenched from a lot of durable goods, trying to understand, you know, what your tenant exposure might be to that product. Will they be able to replace it? Um, so, again, it's trying to understand a little bit more of uh, really looking under the hood a little bit more than you might have before so that when we start to look at this uh, we go and say hey this is a company that might be coming from you know asia that is focused on one part of the market you know for a while we were we were nervous about solar companies you know so again it's trying to understand how that's going to work is there uh u.s government action that could impact uh, some of these companies as well. So, you know, you really have to be broad based about your review and, and really look at a lot more than you might've done five, 10 years ago. I think those are all great observations and, and practices. And from a lender's perspective, we are applying a lot of the same approaches that you touched on there and evaluating um, not just our existing, you know, stabilized portfolio types of clients, but it's prospective clients who are coming in with development uh, opportunities and taking a look at the tenants that are on their short list and or you know, already signed up from a repayment capacity for us as lenders. And you touched on US government activity, there's uh, you know, state action, local action. It's coming in from a lot of different fronts. Mm -hmm. So we're certainly um, trying to stay focused uh, and reach out in events just like this to hear what other folks are hearing and seeing so that we can learn from that. So thanks for your, your thoughts on that. Uh, shifting kind of back to the beginning of the discussion here, um, we've covered what we've seen in the past uh, few months. Uh, now I'd like to ask the group to forecast to get out those proverbial crystal balls uh, about what you see now and year end for leasing velocity. And on that note, I'll turn things over to Tunde. Well, alluded to it earlier that uh, you know, Prologis's experience record highs and, you know, as a data point um, for any lease that we've already started releasing or in negotiations on 71% of those lease strong. Um, and so we're excited about an activity for industrial building. As I mentioned before, I think there'll be a little bit more cautious approach in terms of underwriting. Owners, lenders, the capital stack are kind of really circle the wagons and make sure that their underwriting makes sense as interest rates look like they're gonna in increase. We've obviously seen that the feds indicated that September and December announcements will likely increase rates. So that does change the capital stack and what uh, what developers are looking to pay to acquire new sites and develop them. But we do think that through the end of the year, uh, things are, are, are favorable given that we're in Los Angeles and there's an election cycle uh, in November. Uh, it's prudent to make sure that your jurisdictions are supportive of your projects and the activities for any new new development a coordination with the city and getting that support will be a key uh, key factor to success in terms of getting the permits and the land rights to to build and continue to deliver new product thanks for those uh those thoughts certainly appreciate it uh luke if you would go next please and then we'll let uh alone that uh, clean up here 
So I think leasing activity will definitely pick back up after Labor Day, which it always, always does. Um, I expect to see a new floor set in Class A South Bay, new construction, and for it to be somewhere between 220 and 230 on a triple net basis. I think lease transactions are going to get harder to make as tenants dig their heels in and balk at paying today's market rates and operating expenses using the recession inflation arguments. But I think that um, deals are going to get done and the the 1% vacancy factor will bail out the market until we get a new set of data points, whether it's land sales, building sales, surface lot transactions, or leases. So essentially, I see more of the same that we're seeing today, and I don't see that as a bad thing at all. Alone, you get the chance to close things out for us. Yeah. Yeah, thanks again. And you know, look, I think we 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 concur with Luke. I mean, I think we we definitely expect to see the uptick uh, following Labor Day. Um, you know, a lot of our tenant demand is more on demand than some of other kind of commodity warehouse. Meaning that you know we we tend to see a little bit shorter timelines between tenant requirements uh, and on our sites. And, you know, we are seeing a lot of new users come into the space and we expect that to continue, at least in the near term. And, you know, the, the headwinds are, are clearly going to be how far and how hard the Fed is willing to push the brakes on uh, raising rates, as we touched on earlier, that that could really, you know, slow down demand. And I know some folks would view that as a positive thing if it curtailed some of the rental rate growth. Um, but you know, we're, we continue to be overall bullish where we're heading. And, uh, you know, we are focused on a lot of our development sites because we think that's where the yield is and where we can better match what the tenants out there need um, while carefully, you know, keeping our eyes open for opportunities that may come up. So, you know, continue to be positive through uh, year end. Well, Lone, Tunde, Luke, thank you all very much for your thoughts and comments today. Uh, Josh, thank you and the Los Angeles Business Journal team for providing Farmers and Merchants Bank with a front row seat here to these thought leaders in the industrial space. It's a very important uh, market for our bank and our community here in Southern California. And again, uh, Farmers and Merchants really appreciates the association with the Los Angeles Business Journal. So thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Yeah, th thank you so much. How, how about a virtual round of applause for our, our first panel? Thank you so much to Phil, Alon, Tunde, and Luke. Um, I, I think it's clear there's a lot for us to keep our eyes out on for you know the next three to six months, in particular with interest rates and see the impacts that it's going to have on lending, the economy, uh, supply and demand, et cetera. So, all right, uh, fascinating start. We're now gonna move into our second panel, which is office and the new workplace. So let's meet our panelists. First up, we've got Ryan Harding, Executive Managing Director with Newmark. Next, we've got Matt Hein, Vice Chair with Colliers. Bobby Petticord, Executive Managing Director at CBRE. And today's moderator, Andy Ratner, Executive Managing Director CBRE. Andy, so great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, just had a little internet problem. Can you see me? I can see you. That, I can see give me you. a thumbs up if you see me. Okay. I see you, but you're you're frozen a Got little it. bit. So we might have a little bit of an internet uh, instability. Yeah. Okay. I'm on. I my internet went out. I'm on iPhone. So uh, we'll try try our best. Uh, let me know if it's not working, and we'll figure something out. Uh, anyway, thanks no very much, Josh. Appreciate it, Bobby, Matt, Ryan. It's a pleasure to uh, be here with you on this panel. I'm really excited to hear your views and perspectives. So let's uh, let's get going. Uh, like the industrial panel, we're going to start off with a question for the group. Uh, so here's the setup. The widespread adoption of remote work has caused a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the office sector. Tenants don't know how much space they need or how to lay the space out. Landlords are nervous. Lenders are cautious. And receivers are, give, are gearing up. So what are each of you seeing office occupiers do when their leases come up for renewal? Are they reducing their space, expanding? Are they designing space differently? Bobby, let's go to you. 
Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, and I'll just start by saying, I think in terms of expanding or reducing, it really is all over the place still. Um, it really depends on your industry and your outlook um, for the next few years. There is one consistent thing going on though, which is um, they are redesigning their space. And I think you'll hear a little bit about this as we go forward today, especially for myself. But, but what occupiers are doing is creating more of an experience for their employees, uh, creating more of an, an environment that's uh, welcoming to them and different every day when they come into the office. So, you know, yes, there's a little bit of a trend of reduction in space. Um, it could be anywhere from 10 to 25 percent, but really it just depends on your outlook in the industry. But they definitely are redesigning their space that's more inviting and more of an experience. Great. Bob, uh, Matt, let's go to you. Thanks, Andy. Um, I agree with a lot of what Bobby just said. Um, I, you know, if you were looking for a trend line, clearly more tenants, I think, right now that we're seeing it, it kind of kick the can for the last couple of years. And as, as their space comes up, they're looking at how do I occupy it and, and how do I and what do I do differently? Um, I think more often than not right now, we're seeing that that uh, will result in a in a somewhat of a reduction in footprint, um, not necessarily headcount. Um, in fact, a lot of the companies we've seen headcounts have actually increased over the last few years. But just how they're how they're using it, um, when they're using it, um, and you know, making it more of an experience, like Bobby said, making it um, more of a you know kind of an event type space where employees can can collaborate, they can learn, um, and it's and it's really more about how do I connect with others since I'm not seeing them the rest of the time, um, and I think you know because of that and how they're laying them out. And I think, you know, the days of, you know, eight to five, Monday through Friday, right? Um, through the pandemic, you know, we've all learned that that's, that's something of the past, right? I think there's uh, a lot of flexibility going forward and when and how people come to the office and occupy the office, I think has changed and, and will continue to. Good, Ryan, to you. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Matt. I think, you know, culture would become a very big, uh, buzzword for several years before the pandemic. It is a bigger one now. We are seeing a lot of companies try really hard to get at least three days a week uh, of, of employees in the office. Some are having more success than others. Some parts of the country are having more success than, than Los Angeles. I was on the uh, in the southeastern and midwestern part of the country the, earlier this week, and and there's there there it felt like ninety percent occupancy. Um, and so I think a lot of it has to do with the culture of the company, but some of it has to do with just the general culture of the city. Um, some of it is just the amenities of buildings. Some of it is the, uh, the, the different events that people are doing or that companies are doing in order to get people in. So, uh, you know, culture is going to be something that's harder and harder to effectually effectuate as people work remotely. And as Matt said, I don't think the days of five days a week are coming back anytime soon. And so how do you figure out how to do that? Part of it is the building, part of it's the company, and part of it is just, you know, the people that are there and the events that they're, that they're hosting. Thank you. That leads to the next question. This one's for Matt. Uh, most organizations, I think you guys have just alluded to, believe that getting their people back in the office is key, obviously, to rebuilding co a company culture. Uh, Matt, what are you seeing companies do that uh, are working to get employees back? Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, um, they they have a plan and they're communicating it um, to their employees and their and what the expectations are, right? I think um, I agree with Ryan in that, you know, it, despite you know different industries um, in different geographic regions of the country are acting you know differently, um, you know, and even in some cases the same industries in different parts of the country are acting differently. So. Um, a lot of it has to do with the leadership in those regions. And I think at the end of the day, you know, the, the more senior leadership and uh, the executives um, are key to this equation, right? So if you look at the suburban markets you know, around LA, you know, maybe whether you go to Ventura County or even go you know, further south, Orange County, San Diego, right? Forget about the political spectrum for the moment. If you've got a lot of smaller um, you know, service-oriented companies, you know, 3,000 feet with 10 employees, it's a lot easier to, 
you know, if the boss is in every day, everybody comes in, right? We saw those parking lots and we still do, you know, are a lot more full, right? Then, you know, as you come into city center and, you know, with your modern day tech or entertainment or otherwise, you know, more creative type user that still really haven't gravitated back to the office. So um, I think that the companies that are doing it successfully are figuring out a way to make the office um, a meaningful part of their work experience and giving their younger workforce especially access um, to the key leadership people that are gonna ultimately advance their career and help them to grow and learn in their industry. So um, I think those are the keys that I'm seeing in, in people that are doing it successfully today. But I think having a plan and communicating it effectively and what the expectations are is really what it boils down to. Great, thanks. Uh, Bobby, based on your experience uh, and that of your clients, which workplace amenities or and or designs have had the most uh, positive impact on motivating people to get back in the office? And Andy, I'm going to talk about the fact that we're about ready to finish uh, our office down in the South Bay. Uh, we've gone through a remodel for the past 10 months, but um, the feedback that we're getting from people based on our build out is people are are looking forward to getting back into the office because of the 14 different areas of work uh, space that we're creating for people to come into. So every day they're going to be able to come into the office and work in a different environment within the office. So I think that's really important, right? It adds to the, again, that experience. Um, technology obviously is very important as well. So ease of connecting as well as, look, Zoom rooms aren't going away, so we need to embrace them. Right, but make it easy, right, to get on the Zoom, and for Zoom to be, you know, uh, more user friendly. So uh, those are some of the areas that we're focused on, as well as indoor outdoor areas. We're activating uh, an area downstairs in our old office, uh, adding a patio for you know people to you know have lunch outside for client entertaining. Uh, we're adding openings upstairs as well for fresh air. So it's just like, again, I can't stress enough just that experience of. Of, of a friendlier, more user-friendly environment in the office. Thanks. Ryan, same question to you. Yeah, I think, as I said, I think a lot of it has to do with what you're doing in the office. And, and you know, we're doing something similar in, in several of our offices. We did it in Orange County in our office there a couple of years ago. And so I think that we're, we're learning the same thing. The indoor-outdoor experience is important to employees. Um, you know, we are candidly seeing buildings that are less than probably six stories, six floors are at least better than those that are 60 stories. Um, and I think that has to do with just general sentiment after the pandemic. We are seeing the indoor outdoor space becoming really important. We're seeing the ability to, you know, use stairwells and things like that is still really important to people, whether it's for exercise or COVID or whatever. Um, but I think beyond that, what, like I said, what is the company doing? And, and the easy low hanging fruit are, you know, cocktail hours and dinners and things like that. But there's other cultural experiences that we are seeing companies provide. There are um, different exercise routines. There's meditation things they're doing or yoga or, or other, other areas that uh, I, we met with a, a chief people officer on Monday of a client of ours. And she was telling us that she's getting on average between 30 and 50% to each of their events that don't involve, that don't involve alcohol or food. So, and that 30 to 50% is always different. She said, so sometimes it's a ball game. Sometimes it's going bowling. Sometimes it's yoga. It just depends on sort of what their general interests are, but we're seeing employers get very creative in how they, in how they not only use their space when they can, but also use their dollars towards, you know, making sure people feel connected uh, and then taking their building and sort of supplementing their space with their, you know, we'll call it their, their cultural committee or their cultural routine. I think those two things are really the key to how people are going to bring people back uh, successfully over the next several years. I think the other thing that's important to remember too is I, I you know, we, we, we used to talk about the pandemic in terms of days and weeks and months. And, um, and now I think we're seeing it really, it's really a, a years and maybe even a generations thing. There's there, this is not going to change next month or next year. Uh, the whole, you know, dates on which people are, have to come back to the office and such. We've seen varying degrees of success with that. So 
um, you know, really understanding your workforce, the age of your workforce and what people are looking to do in order to be successful um, and, and really advance their careers, I think is really important. And that's what we're talking to a lot of, like I said, head of HRs and chief people officers and, and, and presidents and CEOs about. Great, great, great stuff. Thank you. Uh, this one's going to be for Matt. This one can go in a lot of different directions. So I'll let you take it where you want, Matt. But obviously, every sub market's different. Product types are different for Office. But what do you predict is going to happen with Office market vacancy over the next couple of years as companies grapple with remote workers and and uh, how much space to take? So you know, we we talked earlier that the trend line is right as companies are redesigning their spaces. You know, generally speaking, their right size and their footprints, and that's. You know, not in, you know, it's industry by industry, right, and sector by sector. But overall, I think, um, particularly if you look at Los Angeles and the greater landscape, right, we have a lot of suburban suburban markets uh, around LA. And I think, you know, it definitely, I would, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, we're definitely seeing a little bit of a flight to quality. And, and as you look around the country, generally speaking, the best buildings in the best locations are actually doing really well. Um, in a lot of cases, their rents are actually uh, well above pre-pandemic levels. Um, some of that's driven by inflation uh, and rise in operating expenses and costs and, and, and certainly in the TI cost. Um, but, you know, the rest of the buildings in the suburban areas that are not amenity driven, that are more commodity type space, you know, are, are having a much harder time attracting um, any tenant at any price. So because of that, I think um, ultimately we're going to see, and we've already seen it, right? Like they talked about this a little bit on the industrial panel is that we're seeing conversions to different types of uses, um, whether it be residential uh, or industrial are probably the two most likely around here with a lot of the, um, you know, the state push to add more residential in, in a lot of these urban areas. So I think you'll see some more of that and some of this, you know, space that's in tougher areas and, and you know, without any real demand um, being converted into other things, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, I don't think, in the long run for the office market, because I think it'll kind of right size the, uh, the product base as well. And, you know, we'll be left with more desirable buildings and more desirable locations and, and probably when, you know, things do turn around in the office market and we see more, um, you know, meaningful uh, growth again, you know, it'll probably coincide with when that product's being removed. So, um, you know, I, I, I think in, over the long run, people are, are creatures of uh, wanting to be around other people. And I think the office serves a big role in that. And um, I don't see that going away, but I definitely, it's gonna be rocky for the next, uh, you know, 12 to 24 months. Thank you. Uh, Bobby, we know that the, uh, the length of the commute is a huge issue here in greater LA. Definitely impacts how often employees want to come in the office. What can employers do to address that? You know, I don't know, Andy. I, I got from uh, South Bay to downtown yesterday in 18 minutes. So I don't know if there is is traffic anymore. That was 2 a.m., Bobby. <laughs> um, look, I mean, we've always known that uh, commuting is unproductive, right? And um, I think what we have to do is embrace a hybrid model of some sort, as well as flexible hours uh, in the daytime. Uh, maybe people come in at 10, leave at six or something, right? So I just think it's all about doing what's best for your employees um, and motivating them to come in the office. But at the end of the day, um, and I think Ryan touched base on this, culture and community cannot be created working remotely. It cannot. Um, you need people in the office. People want to be around people. That's our business. Um, so I think it's important to create those events in the office where people can come in and be around others and do some sort of event, whether it's in the office or, as Ryan said, a game or something. Um, but recognize that commuting is unproductive. People have to do it. Have those flexible work hours, hybrid work hours, um, but create the environment in the office for people to be motivated to continue to come into the office because that is where your culture is created, in my opinion. Good. Hey, Brian, uh, when it comes to how tenants are using their space now or how they're going to use space that they're going to build if they were to relocate, uh, how are they balancing uh, the need for heads down work by their employees versus uh, time when, when collaboration and teaming is, uh, is desired? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. We we deal with it a lot, and we've been asked that question a lot for the last couple of years, really the last year and a half. But I would say, on average, I think there's probably an 80-20 split right now, maybe 75-25 um, from for uh, open space and community space to heads down space. I think that that's generally what we're seeing. I think before it was probably uh, a, 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 it was probably the exact opposite. It was flipped pre-pandemic. So we're seeing a lot more of, you know, no surprises, but a lot of the soft seating and, you know, a lot more conferencing spaces of varying sizes and in various ways, both open and enclosed. We're still seeing the bigger kitchens that are open and providing for more communities, uh, community, you know, activities, both uh, as kind of individual or team meetings, as well as, you know, all hands meetings and such. But um, really bringing the home environment into the office in an even bigger way is something that, you know, the, the tech titans of the world did 20 plus years ago, 25 years ago, and other companies of all sizes are really trying to do that in a bigger way now. I think that, um, you know, there are a lot of law firms that, you know, really haven't really changed their footprints as much. But that's one of the few industries, maybe there's a few service industries, but there's a very few industries that have not wanted to change their footprint. I think the biggest thing is the TI um, component of that and, and where we are and are not successful in doing so. But I think, you know, soft seating, 80-20 split, uh, open areas and giving people, I think Bobby had mentioned, you know, there's 14 different spaces that people can work in your new office. And that's I don't know the size of that office, but uh, I have been in it several times and, and, you know, it was a beautiful office before, but if you give people 12, 14 different areas to work in an office, you're going to be able to attract people to come in and they're going to be excited for those, even if it's only, you know, two to four days a week that they're there, they'll be excited to be there and probably more gelled or more kind of cohesive with the company and the culture and all the things we've been talking about. But I'm going to come back to you in a minute on the subject of TI costs, by the way. Um, hey, Matt, uh, talk about some successful strategies that landlords are using to help get lease assigned during these difficult, challenging times in office. I'm going to remember these, Matt, so let's come on. Let's go. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I mean, first and foremost, uh, the challenges right now facing both landlords and tenants are, you know, used to be that tenants were out, you know, too, too far ahead of their expiration. And, you know, landlords would be like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that deal because, you know, you're 18 months out and I could get somebody in sooner. Now tenants are coming to the table saying, okay, I'm ready to execute and I want to move in in, you know, 90 days. And the, the harsh reality of Los Angeles, especially, is just the amount of time it takes to get space planned, permitted, bid, and built has uh, extended greatly. And I think there's a huge disconnect. Um, between tenants and landlords and the smart landlords and the ones that are being successful are doing a couple of things. One, um, they're pre-building space, um, even if it's in a more generic way, so it's more ready to go. And they're still offering some allowances on top of that to, you know, to retrofit, you know, more specifically to a tenant's needs. But to the extent that you can get tenants in faster, um, I think those landlords are getting more than their fair share. Um, that could be temp space um, or otherwise. Um, so on the flip side, tenants are a little more uh, open, right, to not worrying about holding over their own old lease because, you know, they've been generally working from home for the past, you know, two years anyway. So if it slips a couple of months, that's okay. But by and large, spaces that are built are, um, are more often to lease sooner than later. Um, I think also buildings that, you know, have some sort of Agile or flex provider in the building um, that can that can act as a strategy to help them, um, as Bobby can tell you in, in his project, right? As you know, an ability to rework space, you know, and maybe you can touch down in a more flexible operator for for a period of time while you're doing it. Um, and then I would say, you know, to the extent possible or practical, amenitizing this, the building and giving you know a more uh, common area uh, upgrades. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily be lobby improvements and things, but, it, you know, things like having fitness facilities, um, you know, boot camps, other things that are available to the to the tenants at large. I think um, tenants are, you know, tend to prefer those buildings that are more highly amenitized, um, even more than before. 
and you know, as everyone is grappling with how do you get people back into the office. Thank you. Uh, okay, Ryan. So it can it can cost three hundred dollars a foot or more to build out space for tenants. Uh, allowances have not grown. In fact, in many cases, some landlords are are getting pulled. They're pulling back uh, because of challenges they're facing. What what impact is this having on tenants who really see this next phase as a way to really improve their workplace, reimagine it, rebuild it? Yeah, this is tough. This is uh, we, tenants have, have changed course many times uh, once they have gone down the space planning and construction planning route prior to signing deals to, to prior to signing leases. Um, we've seen number a number a number of them go on hold. We've seen others just decide to do short term, you know, kind of one to three year band aids, even though they know they want to move. I think the the disconnect is that n- not only do tenants need more money to spend in order to build out the spaces they want. But the re- one of the biggest reasons they're doing at that is for all of the thing, the reasons we've discussed, right? It's for that culture. It's for that community. It's for getting people into the office that tenants are paying, companies are paying a lot of money for each month. And so um, it's tough. We have seen several go forward. We've seen quite a few go forward, but we have definitely seen quite a few also pull back and just say, look, I'm going to stay here for one to two years, see what happens in the market see if pricing comes down and we can maybe be in a, a higher class building and paying a similar rate to what we're paying now or to what we're paying in a building that maybe isn't as great. So those Band-Aids are helpful in this in a financial sense, but hurtful from a cultural sense. So we are, we're seeing amortizations and things like that, that we've always done. But uh, I think as Matt really alluded to earlier, the ones that are the most successful are the com- are the buildings that are building out spec suites. Um, maybe there's a small allowance on top of it, maybe there's not, but building out spec suites to get people into this new work environment, we're finding even more than before. There's so many questions about, about what the office space and, and the space plan should look like when, when companies or ownerships provide them with, here it is. I think it's a lot easier for companies to walk in and say, you know what, this is 90% of the way there. And I don't mind spending a little bit more money on the rest of it to get us there. Great. Uh, hey, Bobby, this next one's for you. Uh, obviously, CBRE is very proud of what they did 10 years ago with the first Workplace 360 in my office in downtown LA. Uh, it's, still, it's aging well, we still love it. Um, you obviously are the new version of this and, and are building out your space. You talked about it before. We don't need to spend a great deal of time, but what would you say are the couple of things that are different about what you're doing versus what we came up with uh, 10 years ago. Uh, thanks, Andy. And you guys, uh, 10 years ago, I, I, in my opinion, kind of nailed it in terms of the of the, the setup. Um, I mean, you and Lou and our workplace team um, did a great job. I, I think the changes over the last 10 years are more about, again, the additional areas to work from. Um, so I can't stress enough the fact that we have 14 different areas in the new office in the South Bay to work from, whether that's what we refer to as a huddle room, a Zoom room, uh, the library area, uh, the heart. These are just different areas for people to come in if they get a little different mood. They don't have to go to, to a workstation. They can go work in the heart. Um, they can work in the library where it's kind of quiet. It's a cell phone free zone. Um, so it's just, again, you know, adding different areas that make it exciting to come to the office every day. Um, and then I would say technology. Uh, the technology, again, for quick connectivity when you come to, into the office, for the same experience every time you come into the office in terms of working on the monitors, um, as well as the Zoom rooms, right? Making the Zoom rooms more user-friendly and easy to use and, um, you know, that make uh, those meetings better with our clients and, and our colleagues. Great, thanks. Okay, final question, and this one's going to go to each of you, and it's you, know, you touched on on it a bit during our conversation, but uh, it's a question of flight to quality. Are you seeing it? Where are you seeing it? How's it being manifested? If there's any specific projects that you think have really hit it, but they've done a great job of, of uh, improving uh, so that they can be more appealing to tenants. Love to hear about it. Let's start now with uh, Matt Pine. Thanks, Andy. I mean, look, we've, we've talked about this before. There's absolutely a flight to quality. Um, and Ryan kind of touched on it in one of his previous answers in that, you know, if you can go from 20,000 feet to, you know, 12 to 15, and, you know, maybe you're paying more rent, 
um, but you're giving your employees a much better, you know, experience in a better building, um, you know, and you're paying the same or less than you were before. Um, we're seeing tenants, you know, in those scenarios where because of the price of TIs and whatnot, you know, if you're paying more rent, in theory, you know, the landlord might be willing to give you a little bit more in, in concessions, um, or maybe you're willing to come out of pocket because you're trying to create that culture, you know, to attract and retain great talent. And um, so I think the better buildings have benefited from that. And it's, and it's almost market by market, right? Like, I mean, I could show you examples in Westlake Village and Calabasas and North Hollywood and Pasadena. You know, it, it really doesn't matter where you are. Um, you know, the better buildings and the best locations that have amenities, that have, you know, uh, walkability, parking, whatever, you know, is important to the tenants in that particular submarket um, are performing better. And I think their rents are reflective of that and their occupancy. Thanks. We'll uh, jump to Ryan. Thoughts on this one? Yeah, Matt kind of stole my thunder on this one. I think the sub, the stronger sub markets are the ones that are going to be okay no matter what. So your Culver Cities, Burbanks, Playa Vista, those areas of the of the city have done real, El Segundo's. Um, those areas have done really well, and I think will continue actually to be fine. They may trudge along at a slower pace than what they have over the last couple of years, but they'll fare better than than some other sub markets that haven't done as well, or perhaps that have. You know, I think even as simple as just higher buildings, high rise buildings, more high rise buildings. Um, there's always a flight to quality, not a secret. Uh, I think regardless of the market, good space with great amenities is always going to go. I think the key now is engaging the tenant base that ownerships have to figure out what it is that they really want. So they make sure that they're spending their dollars in the right place and getting amenities there that matter to tenants. I always tell people, I think, you know, even now, even post COVID, putting a gym in a building is, is sort of the low hanging fruit. That's the easy one. But beyond that, what is it and what are what is your specific tenant base? And I think it will it will vary. The amenities will vary depending on the types of tenants that are typically in the buildings that owners control, that they own. So um, focusing on the tenants and really asking them what they're looking for and making sure that they're providing the amenity base that, that works for them and you know, as Matt and Bobby both talked about, you know, upgrading lobbies and elevators and airflows and open air and all that stuff will will really factor in greatly as tenants kind of figure out where they want to be for the next, you know, 10, 15 years. Great. Final thoughts on that, Bobby, Pat Accord, we'll wrap with you. Yeah, Andy, without a doubt, like Ryan and Matt have said, there's definitely a flight to quality. Um, however, um, I also think um, that those projects can transition into, um, you know, projects that provide a bundle of amenities, um, they also can benefit as well. Uh, they just need to make that transition. They need to understand that it is an experience. That's what employees are looking for today. And if they can make that transition on their projects, um, then they'll pick up those tenancy. It just, they, they need to convert it. Um, so it's not just flight to quality. It's also just flight to amenities and experience. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you all, Brian, Matt, Bobby. Appreciate uh, your thoughts and comments. Uh, very informative. And uh, thank you. Throw it right back to, uh, to Josh. Thanks, Andy. You know, I, I think there was a lot of really, really great information there. Um, Matt, and, and I know it was, it was echoed by, by most of the panel. Um, you talked a little bit about heads, head counts being up at companies but footprints being down. I think you used the term right sizing. Um, Ryan, if you have just a second, I'm gonna ask you another question. One of our uh, audience members uh, typed in, you know, as, as you guys were all talking about um, right sizing and footprints going down, a, a question from our audience came in just about what, what happens to all this space in the market as companies are either downsizing or right sizing um, in, in the office world? What, what happens to all this space and how does, how does that eventually impact the market itself? Ryan, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it does. It's, it will impact the market. I, it, it will impact the market. I think one of the things we all have to remember here is even though we're going to see downsizings and even though we're going to see some tough times for 6, 12, 24 months, whatever it is, California still continues to be, an incredible, especially Southern California, both Northern and Southern California as a whole, continue to be a place where people regardless of political views and tax structures, people want to own and operate and start businesses here. We still see record startups every single year. 
So while I think we will see in certain submarkets, candidly, a gluttony of, of, of vacancy, I think that because companies are continuing to grow here, they're still recruiting here. We still have great education systems and colleges and universities and the weather and amenities and, and, and I think, I think the space um, needs will change and I think it will be dramatic, but I think what will also continue to be as relevant is are the number of companies that start here, grow here, um, prosper here, hire here, et cetera. So I think there is a, a, a something, a, something of a reckoning or something like that coming for space as people do downsize. I just, I didn't say it earlier, but you know, on average, I don't know about Bobby and Matt, we're seeing tenants when they downsize, it's by 10%. 15%, we're not, it's the, the space because their headcount is going up. So their space still, even though they're using it on a hybrid basis, they still need that. So we're not seeing 50% reductions and 60% and all these things are hundred percent that we talked about two years ago. We, we surveyed 300 companies that we represent um, back in August of 2020. They predicted it would be between CEOs, CFOs, high level directors, decision makers. They predicted a, a downsizing of space of 10 to 15%. And we surveyed them again recently and it's exactly in that range, so. Yeah, that I think that's interesting. Thank, thank you for thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And, and lastly, I just wanted to, you know, uh, Bobby, Andy, um, I remember having an opportunity to take a tour of the, the, the downtown headquarters probably a decade ago when, when that office was finished and just seeing what a cool model it was for other other companies, in particular in the service industry, I think we've seen uh, similar, uh, some similar uh, activity and changes in professional service firms. We'd love to see at some point when your new office in the South Bay is open. Uh, love hearing about your 14 spaces and getting employees engaged. Uh, I think that's fascinating. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that as well. Thank you and come on by. I look forward to seeing you. Wonderful. Well, Ryan, Matt, Bobby and Andy, thank you so much. I wanna thank everybody from both panels today. For those of you who um, watch, uh, watch us today and think there are those um, in your circles who might benefit from some of the information, a recorded version of this in its entirety is going to be available on labusinessjournal.com. That will be available to send out tomorrow. Um, so please uh, do circulate it and then we'll have additional follow-up um, in the print edition on Monday as well. So I want to thank all of you for joining us. This has been extremely important. Uh, extremely enlightening for, for all of us, uh, just wanting to know what, what direction things are going. And um, we look forward to doing this again soon, hopefully by then in person. Until then, everybody, please stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you again.